Hey guys, good morning. good morning. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Catherine, for even though you have limited time today, like staying behind to participate. I really appreciate that. Um, so today I'm presenting my thoughts, my approach to jujitsu to you guys. Um, along the way, I have created a PowerPoint after being inspired by some of you in this room. <laughs> So I've tried to list some of the concepts that are important to me in jiu-jitsu that I think can... They, I don't think they're specific to the discipline of jiu-jitsu itself. I think they're universal movement concepts that can really give you insight even maybe to your own movement disciplines. I think because we all have human bodies, there are only so many ways that you can move the human body. Right? Even though jiu-jitsu is such a specialized movement platform, I think the movement principles that I've tried to articulate in the PowerPoint, I'll try to articulate to you throughout the course of the session, you'll see, oh, there is a lot of overlap. Like, even with your workshop yesterday, uh, Gary, I, while you were teaching, I was like, oh, wow, there's so much overlap and like so much that I see from my own practice that I was like, oh, wow, but this is in water. And it's actually really hard for me to do. <laughs> um, what I'd like us to do, since we're all seated in a circle, we don't need names because we know each other at this point, but what I would like from you guys is to tell me maybe one curiosity that you have or something you would like to get out of the session. And hopefully we'll try to discuss through the course of the session. And also, if at any point you have questions along the way, please feel free to stop me. Don't wait until the end. I like this to be a shared dialogue between all of us. Okay. And we're starting this side of the room. I think one thing I'm curious about is how it's a generally a partner practice, that at least how I perceive Jiu-Jitsu, um, what are some things that I can try to improve my own solo practice so that when I do, say, roll with other people, how can I, you know, just have fun? Right. I'm just really interested in the way that you teach and present stuff, and I'm sure I'll get a lot out of just like the, the framing and, um, yeah, like, except I think you taking conceptual jiu-jitsu stuff to a level that I haven't yet, and so I'm interested in seeing like, how I can be my box of that, so I'm just here for the red. But <laughs> <laughs> so like how Brandon was saying, it's usually in partners, like how me and Jam were talking about the parkour, you can take a parkour, crazy movements, kind of bring them down, maybe working with just leveling them down to like for a different population, for gender population, like what sort of stuff you can do on your own. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm interested, in, you know, we talked about <coughs> how there's a lot of this full body articulation and, you know, how to orient yourself for specific goals. I'm interested to see that with, you know, this practice or within partner practice, you know, the, the guiding principle of how you orient yourself for what cause, for what reason, and how that takes shape uh, with your form. Uh, kind of piggybacking on that, the... This, and Jen's from yesterday, this idea of center of mass. Like for, like for me, I'm very aware of like the space that I occupy, um, but that internal, like where the axis is, like I'm a little off. Like I realize I, I don't really don't have a center axis. My axis is slightly to the left, right, of, of my midline. So you like Beyonce. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> it, it was this weird, like you have all these assumptions, yeah. uh, but then when you see the pattern, like, oh, everything's shifted. So mm -hmm. how do I find and, and utilize that center of mass too. Absolutely, and when you also have a non-collaborative partner who's trying to constantly move your center mm -hmm. of mass. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's so different, you know? Because like, it's one thing being aware of your center of mass, because like, if there's no one affecting me, right, then yeah. like, okay, I'm here. And then I have someone like, it's tugging on my, my clothes or whatever, or they take on my head, like, oh God. But yeah, we'll get into that. I'm interested in um, what all the touch and kind of close contact and intimacy and the hugging and uh, how that affects 
how that affects you and uh, whether you find any kind of deeper benefit in that, kind of healing benefit as a touch therapist and a hugger. And I just wonder what, whether that, I wonder how that maybe compared to a less full contact kind of interaction, whether that has some you know, cognitive implications or emotional, I don't know, I wonder, because I don't have a lot of experience with that. Yeah. Just to touch on that very, very briefly, I, I feel like because it's such an intimate practice, because there's so much touch involved, a lot of uh, social boundaries dissolve very quickly. You know, like when you, especially coming from British culture where everyone's quite socially <laughs> awkward, you, yeah. know, like, you feel like it takes a while to get to know someone. Whereas you're just suddenly between someone's legs or you're like kind of like sitting on top of them and you're like, it just becomes a completely different way to connect, you know, because you have to also respect each other in this way, you know, you like, you're allowing each other to do a lot of things that, you know, that we don't do in daily life. So it's uh, like this, we almost have to respect people even more. We have to make sure that they're safe. We have to make sure that um, we don't overstep any. So we'll, again, yeah, we'll, sure. we'll have a shared Thanks. conversation about this later. Yeah. It'll be quite interesting. Okay. Yeah. I just think I, I think I just realized like I think I'm also really interested in sort of the between like we talked about like how do we approach to a layman and like mm -hmm. and then here it's like we'll do whatever <laughs> like all the stuff where like I'm interested in that dialogue that you have with the the jujitsu practitioners that like are like I'm here to do jujitsu like what are you doing like how right. how do you integrate that and so, like drawing people in, maybe without, you know, without forcing them necessarily stuff. So, like, right, right, right. a pretty open group, but I still don't know, like, how far I can push that with, like, we're not guys, we're going to dance, and, like, <laughs> this stuff, like, how many of the people would be, like, psyched about that? Or, right, 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 right. Of course. I think it could be interesting for part of the session to discuss, like, format, audience, because yeah. I have a tendency to personalize to my group. Sure. Like, not everyone's a competitor, or not everyone wants to just do jiu-jitsu. They're like dancers coming to do jiu-jitsu that just want a certain type of physicality that comes from jiu-jitsu that they can take the nuance from and put back into their dance and stuff. Mm -hmm. so I think it's just a matter of, again, like going back to what we were talking a bit about yesterday, like, like we talked about mainstream fitness and how, you know, like we want to kind of like make people connect more, but it's really about what do people want? If that's not what they want, then they don't necessarily need to have that. It's just our personal bias, right? Um, yeah. But we'll, I think, again, another interesting conversation. <laughs> but to not go, uh, to not waffle too much, I'm gonna go to the PowerPoint now. So let's shift our attention to this very spontaneously made <laughs> so what I try to articulate is creating this movement mind map of how I can move my body in space so in relation to the floor by myself first because it, it's almost like the, all the human ideas that we think of for example like uh, you have to know oneself before you know another or you have to love oneself. <laughs> you have to you have to almost love yourself before you can love someone else. These sort of ideas, right? It's almost the same thing. What? <laughs> <laughs> it's almost for me at least the same ideas. How can you move with a partner if you have no reference to how to move by yourself? in the space, okay? And this is always why I like to start with a self-inquiry first, like, oh, how does it feel to just walk in a split stance, perhaps, you know? Like, how does it feel if I shift my torso? How does it feel for me to cycle the weight between my front and rear leg, okay? Um, so I'm slowly, like, building this map for myself. I'm like, oh, okay, I can move forward like this. I can move sideways, I can cross that. How does it feel if I use my arms as counterbalance, right? Um, so I start having this like, I started from this little dot on the map and slowly is expanding. It's like going to travel almost, right? As we travel, like, 
perspectives expand. Uh, we get more culturally immersed, we know more. Same here. Then slowly, as I come into contact with my partner, again, this map is starting to expand once more. Now, this step, it's about collaboration. If suddenly I'm, res I'm facing, encountering all this resistance, I'm in this state of high stress. I can't relax. I don't move well. I have a lot of tension in my body. When there's tension, you're inefficient. A lot of my ideas in jiu-jitsu are rooted around movement efficiency. I, talk, I have a slide about force economy, which would be quite interesting as well. A lot of, uh, again, a lot of my ideas in jiu-jitsu, they, again, they reflect my personal experiences, my stylistic preferences of how to move. As a competitor, we're often told that we should impose our game. Okay, like, it doesn't matter what you do. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna talk over it. Okay, and how I like to almost uh, talk about jiu-jitsu is having a shared dialogue with someone. Like, we're having a shared conversation. One is speaking, one is listening, okay? So I feel like if I say I have to impose my game, it's having a one-sided conversation. It's like, I'm just talking over you. I'm the only one talking. Of course I'll win the conversation. I think to be a really great Fujitsu practitioner or to really, not even let's not even talk about great, just to really enjoy and embrace the art for what it is. It's not about imposing the game. It's about, I want to let you speak. You have your piece, you tell me what you need to say. And I'm going to talk with you and see where it goes from there. So in that way, I let you say your piece. And if I can still, let's say if it was an argument, I'm winning the argument, but you still said your piece, you know, instead of not letting you talk at all. Okay, so no more tangents. <laughs> Let's continue. Okay, so the mind. I think we don't start from the body, we start from the mind. It's like, why would you even go to a jiu jitsu class in the first place? It's a uh, curiosity. You want to try something new for the first time. Maybe you've never done any floor work or groundwork in your life before. Similar to my own personal experience, I started doing mainly stand up stuff when I was younger. I had a background in Chinese martial arts from the age of six years old. When I came to my first Jiu Jitsu class, I was curious. I had no insight, no information on how to move my body in relation to the floor. I was so used to standing on my two feet, doing kicks, doing punches. Suddenly I'm on my back on the floor, I'm lying down, I'm like, oh my god. What is this? Like, why, why am I here? What do I do? Oh my god. And then suddenly, I'm muscling through everything. I'm like, oh my god, why am I? I've never been so exhausted like this in my life. Like, well, what is happening? So, just to briefly cover a few things that I think could be useful to just think about over the course of the session. Um, I think everybody has a bit of ego, even if we don't like to admit it. I like to think that I don't have ego. I like to think that I don't like, I don't need to win every single exchange. I think this, um, the topic of winning and losing a lot in jiu-jitsu for most people who go into class, because again, it's always in this traditional format that has come again from our predecessors. We're constantly thinking about how can I dominate or like I need to win this exchange or this is how I perceive my success in the room. I think instead of having this big macro goal in jiu-jitsu, we can think about the smaller micro goals. And sometimes these smaller micro goals is just observing how you're moving in relation to your partner. It could even be something like, how do I manage this space? How do I control the distance between you and I? Okay. Um, I think for the purpose of learning, it's good that we don't think about winning or losing as well. If we're just so focused on the winning and losing, a lot of the time we'll try and overcome the other person with whatever physical attributes that we may have, right? Whether I'm stronger, I'm more athletic, I'm faster. Uh, sometimes you may just hold your opponent because you think, oh, okay, if I'm controlling you, and this is the overall objective to control, right? Essentially, that's all I need to do to win. 
So you outsmart in the game in a way, right? Because you're like, oh, okay, I've won, I've won, I've won. But the idea, if really we're supposed to be artists or practitioners of this art, the idea is not, let's explore the realms, the platform of jiu-jitsu. So see what, how much movement is involved in the art. Um, and yeah, I think for me personally, as a competitor, and also just as someone who's genuinely really passionate about teaching, really passionate practitioner of the art, I think on the road to the never ending path of mastery, because you can, I don't think you can ever really call yourself a master at your art, you're just constantly on this path, like it's almost like thought like tree. You're, you're never gonna, <laughs> never gonna reach it. <laughs> but that's kind of a beautiful thing, like this floating destination. Um, I think in order to better learn, we need to really dissolve this idea of winning and losing. Okay, so today will not be a day of winning. Thank you very much. Yes. Now to go a bit onto the body, we briefly touched on it already when I did the introduction. When we start, which will be in a second, I'm not going to go through all the slides just yet. We have to first refer to ourselves in space. So how do I move by myself? Right, because the normal, our normal daily life mechanics do not reflect anything of what look, we do in jiu-jitsu. Like we used to just like walking or maybe like running, right? Understanding um, weight distribution, split stance, or like where is my center of mass as well? If I have an extreme forward knee, it means I'm extremely loaded on my front leg. This also limits my mobility in a way that I cannot move my body in certain directions efficiently. Okay? There's no right or wrong answers. Okay? This is your solo investigation. I want you to explore, to observe your own body first before I propose more ideas. Okay? After we do the self-inquiry, it comes this collaborative exchange with our partner. We would briefly touch some contact improvisation um, exercises as well. I think it's really important to start from a perspective of sensitivity training, right? Because how I really like to illustrate, if I may borrow you here for one second, how I like to illustrate sensitivity is also linked with stress. When I'm with my partner in space, like how I touch them may stress them in a certain way. Where especially because there's so much resistance involved in combative uh, exchanges, right? If I just touch his arm like this, I'm, ma I'm managing the stress in such a way I don't, I don't alert him. I don't make him think he's in danger. I don't, if I grab him like this, there's suddenly, oh, I'm in a high stress environment. If I grab him like this, he's like, oh, okay, like, I'm relaxed. There's a different movement quality. As we start from this baseline of starting from low stress, slowly going to high stress, we're able to find a better flow of our partner too. It's like if I suddenly start shouting at him, like, ah! I suddenly start shouting at him in a conversation. He's like, oh, whoa, whoa, what the fuck? But if I like have a discussion with him and we slowly bring up the pace and we're more on the same terms, like we can really get to like the root of whatever we need to get to. And I get to know him better through that process rather than just shouting and imposing my will and imposing myself upon him. And I think in that way, dialogue is about also building a relationship with your partners. Um, and to get a better flow, yep. It's just saying like, that is all coming from, from your side of things. So like a common discussion as well as like, how are you dealing with somebody that's coming and shouting at you? Like they're the ones initiating the conversation. So then is that kind of coming next when you talk about like dealing with the more variable stuff? I, yeah, but we can talk about this now too. So like if it's someone else who's shouting at me, 
I can choose to respond in the way that I would like. It's like if he shouts at me, I don't have to shout back. Right, I the way I resolve it, like I communicate the way that I want. Even if he's gonna grab me like this, mm -hmm. right? I can still decide to okay, let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like this idea of path of least resistance, rather than going like if I'm pushing him, push me, like, push me, push. Actually, you push me because you're the one shouting at me. Ah! He's, he's pushing me, right? I don't have to. I don't have to oppose him. Ah! I can go around mm -hmm. him, right? But like. More, more this idea of uh, I, I can choose the way that I choose to respond, which again I think it's a very human thing, and it's again a very it's a very personal stylistic preference because like I don't I always talk about my jujitsu being lazy, but again it's not about being lazy; it's about being efficient. It's about me not wanting to exert the force into my partner; rather, I want to exert the force that is more directional. So if he's trying to go this way, I'm trying to, okay, I, I'm gonna move around it, I move around it. And again, a lot of martial arts principles, like it is about like avoiding the force. Like I don't, why would I want to receive the impact rather than like if I can just divert it? It's much more efficient, it's much uh, a happier experience yeah. too. I, I appreciate this in the conflict, or the context of like conflict and argument just the same. And you know, there is a certain reciprocity between, um, you know, when somebody says something, choosing a response over reacting with the same level of intensity that they have, and, and, and choosing to respond and continue with your message, you don't fall in to somebody else's, you know, frustration, ego, animosity, hostility. You know, so the parallels there, you know, obviously it's conflict, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's an interplay between two entities, whether it's emotional or physical or what have you, the parallels are still there. It's very off-putting for the aggressor, usually. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why are you going to give a thought? Dissipation of the... Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, because if you think about the history of the art, which is always quite informative, it's, uh, we're trying to use... Uh, minimal force essentially to overcome often maybe a bigger opponent how can I not strike or kick my partner how can I just move around the force but still maintain control and get away safely right um, I think if we think that we can resolve conflict by just going head-on like this especially in a physical encounter it's usually always the stronger person who wins. So then this goes back to physical attributes, and the physical attribute is not necessarily a part, it's not at the core of the art. It is definitely included in the art, because again, it's your body. We're all stewards of our body. Um, it's a facet, but it's not the core of it, right? If I'm strong, it doesn't really mean I have better jiu-jitsu. Maybe I'm a better athlete. Okay. Um, and yeah, so like when we get into the content improvisation exercise, it is largely nonverbal dialogue. Jiu-Jitsu is nonverbal dialogue. I would never say, I'm going to grab your arm, <laughs> pull it on the diagonal, come around and take your back. I'm not going to talk to you. I'm not going to talk you through your moves. I'm like, I want you to move here in space so I can get to you back. I would never do that, right? <laughs> so it's how do I communicate with my body with you? And again, this whole idea of touch, like how I can signal to you, how can I keep you calm so I can move around your body in a more efficient manner? If I grab you like this, definitely if you grab me like this, I'm like, oh shit, okay, like, I'm gonna get ready. Like I know that like you're gonna go crazy on me. So. <laughs> right, but if you confuse me, it's a very uh, meta kind of art as well. If you just go like, oh, okay, we're on the same wavelength, let's talk. And it becomes a way more interesting conversation rather than Oh God, I know like after this roll, I, um, like my trap's gonna be so tight, my, my shoulder's gonna be up here, mm -hmm. I can't move. That, that's not what I like about the art personally. Um, yeah, can I ask a question? I'm so sorry, this absolutely. is so interesting and important. Uh, not everyone responds to conflict with conflict. There's a lot of people that are gonna lock down and, and, and a lot of people that are gonna run. And, and that, that'll reflect itself in the training. And it's really, oh yeah. And, and it reflects in your life, you know, and, and you, get, you might get beaten up. And uh, 
and you know, emotionally or, or verbally or, or not. And it just seems like, and of course what we need to work on is the practice in and out of these situations that are safe so we can develop you know, fluency, confidence, and resilience, right? And it really seems like this kind of training would be really good for that. Really good for, for recovery through, of trauma and being able to engage in a nice kind of measured, forceful interaction that was gratifying and safe. Absolutely. And I've actually had many of those thoughts before, too, because I, I thought about, you know, the ideas of touch as therapy and how disconnected we are as a society, for the most part, you know, where, like, face down on our phones all day, like, we don't, we don't talk as much, we don't touch each other as much, like, we find touch weird in a non, like, a non-romantic uh, situation. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, I mean, just through my own experience of uh, observing other people in the art too, like, I've seen, like, really timid people who really struggled with conflict resolution become much confident movers, but just also much more confident people in general, because they're starting to build this relationship with their body, and they're starting to really understand who they are, like, a bit better. Like, even if sometimes it's just coming from, like, oh, I understand how to move my body better, I feel like, again, this is very personal to me, but the better that I understand to move my body, the better that I understand like all these uh, little ways to converse with my partner in space, I feel like I reflect it a lot into my own personal life as well. Like, how do I, how do I communicate with others? Like, am I very non-confrontational? I am a very non-confrontational person in general. I don't like to argue. That's why it reflects in my jiu-jitsu as well. I do not want to impose my way upon you. I go around the path of least resistance. So, I, yeah, I do think that there are ways that you could integrate it into that. Well, you may be interested too, Jim. Like, there's a lot of, there's more and more programs around, at least the US, that like, are targeted towards like ex-military, like when you keep dealing with PTSD type stuff. Yeah. And as she's saying, like the nonverbal dialogue, like people that feel like they can't express what they're going through, have some semblance of like, some capture of regression or release or like in this physical way. And even, you know, gyms that aren't as evolved as like the way Mars is thinking about it, you're like, oh, this seems to help even in a crude setting. It's like, um, it's been very helpful for a lot of PTSD people. Cool, very cool. Do you have? I do, yeah. No, I, uh, it's kind of uh, not necessarily a sidebar, but you know, I'm interested because you said you use soft touch, and it's just, it's all a game of chess, you know. Absolutely. So when I feel I feel like I would start to think like, okay, like what's their next step? Like, what are they trying to do? I get to soft touch. I see what you're doing. I do soft touch to get around you. Absolutely. So I'd still freak the fuck out if somebody doing soft touch. Like, yeah. you know, like I'm still seven, man. I see you. <laughs> That's so exciting. It's like, man, like uh, everyone gets that. Like, like, uh, oh, she's being soft. Okay, like I'm good. Like I'm safe. And there's you know? different types of strength too. Absolutely, strength and then it's all fluidness. It's all down to personal interpretation, you know. Because like I, I really personally enjoy like the meta game mm -hmm. of jujitsu. Like, what can you understand from my non-verbal dialogue with you? But there's like, so many moves though too. It's just because like just because like the soft touch is happening here, there's always a, a counter move, or there's always a way to kind of play around with absolutely. it. Absolutely. Like you know, where so. is your attention? Sure. Like in regards to my body, you know? Because mm -hmm. again, something that I'll lead into later on in the session is I divide the body into three different parts in Jiu Jitsu in terms of like what do I observe? Mm -hmm. The head, the torso, and the legs, so the lower body, right? And uh, I see a lot of beginners in jiu-jitsu and even, like, n not beginners, like, even people who are very advanced in the art, they move in such a way that it's, like, there's not much movement. You see, like, oh, okay, it's just the legs kind of moving, <laughs> more or less, yeah, and the hands. So it's very, actually, easy to track the movement of the person. If you look at a boxer, they're slipping the head, the shoulders, the, the, the footwork is much more uh, sophisticated, mm -hmm. right? Then there's so many things to take... Uh, to take in, to observe. And when I have all this visual information, it's like, shit, where do I watch? <laughs> and when you have so much visual stimuli, 
I don't know maybe what you're going to pay attention to, but I can do these visual things that may confuse you along with my soft touch. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the idea, like soft touch is one thing, yeah. like okay I communicate you with this. Another thing I'll lead into is tempo, mm. because how I describe to some of you like over the course of the last few days, like how can we use tempo as a tool as well? Like in dancing we usually like we add a very constant tempo, like da, 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 da. We have to establish a certain type of rhythm with our partner first. When we can establish this rhythm, it's like, okay, we're working at this pace, so. It's like a bar of music, and I have four beats. Let's say we have four movements in one bar of music instead, right? And I know between each of these movements, that's my window, that's my opening. So if I decided to break the rhythm, I would have to enter in this little window. So if it's like, then maybe I have to go like, I have to find a way to slide into that window. Okay. Oh, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> what I'd like us to do, to briefly interrupt the PowerPoint, I want you to find a space in the room. It could be on the mats, it could be on the hard floor, it doesn't matter, okay? Just find a space in the room by yourself for now. Put on some music, <laughs> and then I'll, I'll talk about it, okay? If you need to get a drink, a glass of water, whatever, Okay guys, so I want you to just start looking around the space. At your own pace. Could be fast, could be slow. And really, really explore all around the room. How do your feet feel in relation to the floor? Where do you feel the weight is in your feet? Where do you feel right now? Where, where is that center of mass for you? Where do you think it is? Where are you gazing? Who's in the room? Really try and make an effort to look around the space too. Like, what color is the wall? What color is the floor? How many doors are there in the room? How many people are there present? How much space is there between you and the nearest person? Is there a certain rhythm in the way that you walk around the space? How do you move your upper body in relation to your lower body? Do you feel like you're completely over your center? Are you forward tilted? trying to move slightly closer to one person in the room. This can constantly alternate. You don't have to stay around the same person the whole time. But just starting to become more, more aware of how I move in relation to a partner without touching them. Don't be afraid to make eye contact. <laughs> <laughs> Before you begin, it, don't be afraid to make eye contact. <laughs> 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 so much bars. Leaving an eye contact. Ugh. I, I saw you were down with gazing at me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you. Really true point there. Again, try and observe what your partner is doing. Do you see any repeated movement patterns right now? How do they move their heads? Are they quite static in a certain part of their body? Are they happy? Are they sad? <laughs> and again, if you would like to disperse and just walk around by yourself, you're also welcome to. Remember, this is your own dialogue. This is your narrative. Um, at your own 
in your own time level, I'd like you to start using your hands to enter the floor. And see what different ways you can move on the floor. Could be knees on the floor, knees off the floor, quite a feel, tripod. How can you create more mobility in your body if I have maybe fewer points of contact on the floor? Or maybe more uh, contacts, points of contact on the floor? to the speed of the movement too. What feels like a comfortable tempo for your movement? How do you like to move? What feels good in your body? I think a large part of Jiu-Jitsu is about how you can maintain an environment that feels comfortable for you and again, still flow with the top move. Try and really explore as many different movements as possible. There is no right or wrong in self inquiry. What are my tendencies in shifting the weight between my left and right side of my body? I want you to slowly find yourself sliding down with your back now. How does the weight feel in relation to the floor? Where do you feel you can hold tension? How does it feel to have an extended posture on the floor? you to bring your knees in towards your hip bone, almost like a crunch position. Yes, and now the self-inquiry begins again. I'd like you to just try and move around in this position. You can bring the shoulder off the floor, but stay lying down the floor for now. When I bring my legs into extension, how does it feel? I bend my legs, how does that feel? When I think about extension and the bending of my legs, how, how do I think about power? How do I generate power in my body? In what positions do I feel vulnerable? In what positions do I feel powerful? Do you feel stronger in a crunch position? Do I feel stronger in an extended position? What do my arms do in relation to the rest of my body? Again, how can I use my arms to reinforce my spine and my legs? How can I work everything together as a unit? How do I create this house with my body? Where do you gaze with your eyes? I want you to keep continuing as you are, but now imagining like you have a partner with you. Where are they? What are they doing? Let's say, this said partner is trying to pass your hip line, maybe just to stand next to you. Let's say 
that you don't want them to put their weight over you. You don't want them to lie on the top of you. How can I move my body in such a way that I'm using my frames, so my frames such as my arms, my legs, to momentarily block them, but still managing to have a fluid exchange and constantly move. They, that's their objective, to pass my hip line. I don't understand how to pass your hip line. So if you don't want me to do this. Uh, well, I'd like you to stay down there. You want to at least block with your legs uh -huh. with your arms. Okay. So Just my mission is always to come in. Yes, oh, exactly. Okay. So you can... So you have my face. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. You want to maintain a bit of distance. And now you can also come to your butts. How many ways can you move in this seated position? How do you use your feet to create space? To manage the distance between you and your partner? Let's say now they're in front of you and they're trying to walk towards you. Maybe you again, maybe doing like diagonal movements to try and get past the hip line. I saw technical stand up on the way yesterday. <laughs> now coming up to standing whenever you are ready now. 